All right, guys, welcome to the I Love Seville show. It's great to be with you. Thank you kindly for joining us. It's a Thursday in Charlottesville, Almaro County in Central Virginia. We have a fantastic program lined up for you. Star Hill in the news, TV, news, radio, newspaper on our show with what they're doing at Dairy Central. A tap room. I've seen the pictures. They sent it out with the press release. It looks freaking amazing. Um, Star Hill, the second oldest beer brand in the city of Charlottesville. We're going to spotlight their evolution and how this tap room is going to drive, I think, even more of an impact to that Midtown and Preston corridor. Um, I think, you know, my good buddy owns Peloton Station on Temp Street, right around the corner from Dairy, Dairy Central. That little quarter is exploding and really blowing up. We're going to spotlight that with the Star Hill fellas here in a matter of moments. We've also welcomed Holly Lee to the show. She knows the Charlottesville economy inside and out, knows workforce development inside and out, roundtable discussion on what's happening in our ecosystem in Charlottesville and how it's going to trickle over to Albemarle County and the rest of Central Virginia. Let's thank some of the people that make the program possible. First, one of our favorite clients, we're their advertising agency of record, and it's Interstate Pest and Service Company. Companies. This business started in 1969 with one man and one truck. Mr. Wells would go to the first home, service it successfully, then head to the second home. Before he was there, he would go to the closest pay phone in 1969, call his customer and say, can I come see you now? Today, it's a four-generation strong family business, four generations, almost 100 employees, a commonwealth-wide footprint, the headquarters around the corner from Bodo's, an office in Richmond, and an office in the Shenandoah Valley. Another one of our favorite clients is the good doctor, Scott Wagner of Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine. Whether it's sports medicine, physical therapy, or chiropractic care, Dr. Wagner and his team have your back. Harris Tolber is our director. Harris, I think we should go to the studio cam and let's welcome everybody to the show. Um, Duke, Robbie, and Holly, kind enough to join us. We will go ladies first and we will start with Holly. I'm going to ask you two questions. Sure. The first question is introduce yourself to the audience, mm -hmm. what you do with the city of Charlottesville, and then we're going to get into your personal hobbies and passions. Uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Holly Lee, and I work for the city of Charlottesville, and I'm in the Office of Economic Development. I do uh, workforce development and then a, a big focus lately on minority businesses and women-owned businesses in Charlottesville. Um, I've been with the city for almost 12 years now in economic development. So like you said, I know it fairly well, but I don't know if I'd say inside and out. There's so much going on, it's hard to keep up. Um, how about personal hobbies, interests, passions? What you do when you're not around City Hall or walking up and down the downtown mall? Well, you probably saw me when I came in when I saw your mascot. <laughs> I had to stop. So I'm a big dog lover. Um, I spend time with my um, husky and my hound, Luna and Toby. So a lot of that. A lot of family time. Love my parents, my sister. Today is actually my uh, niece's 16th birthday. So shout out to Abigail. Happy 16th. Um, flowers are on the way. Um, but yeah, so just a lot of family, dogs friends, relaxing when I'm not working, which I'm kind of a workaholic, so. <laughs> I'm also a workaholic. I think it comes with the nature of trying to be, uh, you know, successful and going where you want to go. Duke and Robbie, these guys work their tails off as well. Duke, we will start with you and get straight to the news. Um, new tap room. Dude, it looks bona fide. I mean, it looks Thanks. sexy. Yep. It looks mm. cool. Um, it's in an area that I think is going to thrive and boom. I'm going to get out of your way. The new tap room at Dairy Central. Yeah, so we've been looking at a location downtown in Charlottesville for quite a long time. As you guys probably know, we started in 1999 down on West Main Street, and we've been looking for an opportunity to get back down into downtown Charlottesville. I really like the dairy project for a lot of reasons. One is that area on Preston we think is going to be you know, an explosive growth area going forward, great visibility, et cetera. But the other thing is the partners who are developing the project, Stony Point, have this new food hall concept, which is to bring in, you know, local um, chefs, et cetera, to set up food halls, and we would be, you know, an area for them to uh, taste their food as well as to obviously grab a beer or grab a pint if they so choose. Um, I love it. Robbie, we'll get you in the mix here. Brewmaster, um, head of production, beer production as well. Um, let's talk Dairy Central. Um, you're a young guy. You know Charlottesville. Um, right now, you guys are in Crozet. You guys are a key component to Crozet. I think bringing the brand to Charlottesville, you're going to get potentially even a younger crowd being touched by your brand. You could get University of Virginia students. He's a UVA guy. I'm a UVA guy. When we go to UVA, we get touched by brands in Charlottesville. And then inevitably, we want to move back to Charlottesville because Charlottesville has that allure. I love this game plan. Talk to us about Dairy Central. Yeah, so one of the th exciting things out in Crozet, you know, it's a different vibe out there. We're in a production facility. We're in a food manufacturing facility. Uh, it's a reuse building. There's, you know, 
there's massive benefits, but there's, you know, it being further outside of town has its disadvantages. And I think connecting with the everyday Charlottesvillian is difficult when you're that far out of town. It's you know, relatively inconvenient. Um, with moving into the dairy, we now have this touch point that is going to be a regular, um, you know, with the food hall concept and um, the ability to kind of showcase some of these new beers that we're doing, uh, the new brewing processes we're using, um, I think it's going to help connect people to the brand even more. Lots of people know our brand. We're, we're well aware of that. We're, you know, we're one of the best distributed brands in the state, um, but a lot of people don't know that we do, you know, there's 24 beers on in, in Crozet, most of which, uh, you know, the Charlottesvillians will have never heard of, for example, and unless you come out to the brewery out there, you don't know that we do. And being able to share those kinds of things with, you know, our core customer base um, is going to be pivotal for us. I love that answer. I'm going to throw one more to Duke, then get you in the mix, mm -hmm. um, Holly, of how you see this potentially impacting the landscape mm -hmm. of the city from an economic standpoint. My question for you, Duke, and you have historical perspective as a 98 UVA grad. I remember early in my time in Charlottesville, I've been here since 2000, partying and getting after it at the Star Hill on West Main. I remember climbing those stairs, listening to great music. I remember those stairs in that floor almost like shaking and wobbling, okay? Being packed and just falling in love with Star Hill. The question for you is the evolution of Star Hill in totality from when it started to, what it is, to where it is today. Yeah, so what you're alluding to, Jerry, is kind of the experience that we're trying to get back to, which is you know, when we decided to move out of West Main, out to Crozet, the idea was to have more production capacity into a much larger facility so that we could distribute beer widely throughout the state. Um, what has happened, uh, mainly due to some legal cha law changes over the last uh, you know, eight to nine years, is that all these breweries have exploded all over the state, and obviously Charlottesville is one of the main areas for that. And that's because there was a law that was passed that allowed breweries to start uh, selling their own beer, uh, at the brewery itself. And before that happened, other breweries really couldn't afford to open up. So we went from, I looked at this earlier, went from you know, 20, 25 breweries to now almost 275, 280 breweries in about nine years because of this law. And as a result of that, the experience that you have in the tap room itself is essential to building your brand. Because as anyone knows that goes to shop for beer at a grocery store or a bottle shop, there's a lot of options out there. So being able to connect with the customer in a one-on-one -on -one environment with your people, your customer service, as Robbie was talking about earlier, the beers that you want to be able to show them is super important in terms of building your brand going forward. So that's what we're hoping to get to. I don't know if we're going to have the upstairs music hall that we had on West Main, but the idea is the same, which is a great experience for people to connect and hopefully uh, be more attracted to the brand. I love that answer. So Sizzle Reel, the first one, my first question to Duke, Robbie's question, and then Duke's third, second question there. That's a highlight reel we're going to cut from the show, uh, an approachable clip. I'm going to get Holly in the mix here. First, let's thank some of the folks that are watching. We have Lee Hughes, the power commercial agent, watching right now. You know Lee, obviously. Uh, James Watson, Roger Voyenze, Andre Xavier, owner of Seville Hop on Tours, John Kerber, president of Dominion Custom Homes. I kind of see this like I make a lot of trips to Asheville. One of my favorites is Wicked Weed. When I go to Wicked Weed, it's like, like you're saying, to take a phrase from you, it's all about the experience. The food is on point. The beer is on point. There's music. There's an ambiance. There's like a feel. And because of this like destination type of concept, I go there more often. I, I come for the beer. I stay for the food and the experience. Uh, and I think that's what's happening in Dairy Central and what's going to happen at Dairy Central. Question to you, mm -hmm. how do you see this impacting the economy in the city of Charlottesville? I think it's gonna have a big impact on our economy. Um, the you know, brewing industry, craft beer has already impacted our economy in terms of tourism and then local, you know, locals that, that drink and enjoy um, beer here in the area. In addition to that, I mean, with the food hall you all mentioned, that's gonna be a great opportunity for small businesses. And I already know of a few who are gonna be utilizing that space so that they can expand their businesses. And then in terms of workforce, I mean, you all are gonna definitely be hiring people. And so will the other businesses who will be located in that space. So just over Overall, the whole gamut of economic development is being touched by you all being there. City Hall and how it responds to the, the breweries within city proper. I mean, you guys love it. 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Again, that e economic impact on, you know, the, the tax base, you know, the workforce development piece of it. We have the ale trail that we've been partnering with local breweries on. So uh, things like that, it just drives the economy here in Charlottesville. We're live on seven channels on the I Love Seville network. If you have a question or comment you want to relay to the fellas or to Holly, I'm happy to do that. Thank you for sharing the feed, Keith Smith. We appreciate that. I'm going to throw this to you gentlemen. Either one of you guys can take this. Um, through this in the beginning of the show, rising tide, good for all ships. Uh, Charlottesville is becoming a mecca. I'm not going to exaggerate and say it's you know on the same level as say a Richmond or a Scott's Edition or even in Asheville, but it could eventually head in that direction. Throw it to you guys. All these breweries in the city of Charlottesville, I mean you got Three Notch, Champion, mm -hmm. um, you got Raynham Row, you got Harley, Hardywood's got a pilot, Wild Wolf just opened, mm -hmm. you guys. Talk to us about having a close cluster of all these breweries, Robbie. Um, so the the brewing community in general has been pretty strong, kind of a tight knit group for a long time. So there's a lot of you know, we've always kind of viewed it as such. But I think that what you're what you're, the point you're bringing up is good because when Charlottesville turns into a tourist destination for breweries, much like Asheville has, mm -hmm. then it's kind of an explosion. I mean, obviously my family's still in Asheville, and I've got a lot of interest in Asheville and we pay attention to how the economy is doing down there and they've had something like 14 hotels open in the past 12 months mm -hmm. because tourism is out of control down there. I mean it's really getting to the point where uh, you know there is no limit to what they what they really see um, Asheville becoming and everyone is benefiting from it. A and perfect example of this is Andre Xavier who's watching now mm -hmm. the owner of Seville Hop on Tours a business has sprung, an auxiliary business has sprung because of the aggregation of breweries. Exactly. And that's the idea is that, you know, when we're, when there are a bunch of different breweries, you know, one of the things that we pride ourselves in, and I think a lot of other breweries do, is that, you know, we offer a specific experience, not super specific, not niche necessarily, but an experience. And if, you know, there's multiple different kinds. We're not all just spitting out the exact same experience over and over again. If you want to go um, out to, uh, if you want to have kind of a farm brewery experience, there's farm brewery experiences. If you have a local um, you know, grunge music scene experience, there's a local grunge music beer ex uh, scene experience. If you want to have a kid-friendly experience, there's a kid-friendly experience. And so I think as long as we're remaining unique in what we're offering and we're not churning out the exact same model over and over again, it's going to help drive overall your tourism to the city of Charlotte. We have the teams at Three Notch and the teams at Champion watching right now when you're talking kid friendly and grunge, they're watching right now. <laughs> Duke, you have a background in finance. Uh, tough question for you here. Um, do we get to a point that it's saturation? Yeah, we've seen some slowdown in the overall craft beer market nationally and as well as in the state of Virginia, but what we haven't really seen a slowdown in is the experiences people are having at these breweries themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's millennials or folks older like myself, uh, there's definitely a appetite to go to these breweries themselves and experience that. And that's really an opportunity that allows you, again, to generate, of course, revenue, hire people, et cetera. But the most important thing is that's how you build the brand, and then hopefully it translates into aftermarket sales as well. So we don't see a slowdown in that side of the business. Um, while the grocery side definitely has slowed a little bit over the last year and a half or so, yeah, the in, uh, in, in person experience seems to be remaining very strong. I threw this to Mary Wolf uh, when Mary and Danny joined us on the show. The opening of tap rooms and how it strategically fits the the long term plan of the business model. That question. Yeah, you. if you don't have you know the, the traditional way to build a beer business is you go out and get taps at bars and sample at events and do sponsorships and things like that, and that's the opportunity for consumers to you know taste your product and then hopefully that translates into sales when they go to Wegmans or Harris Teeter or Kroger or Food Lion etc. That model's changing a little bit because the customer demands new brands all the time. So the products that are on at a bar one day might be off the next day. And as a result of that, it's very difficult to consistently build your brand in what we call the on-premise segment of the business. So what's become more and more important is to have these controlled environments where you can have the employees you want, the customer service you want, the aesthetics, the vibe, the feel that you want for the customer. And then hopefully that translates into the market and aftermarket sales. I think that's the business model that most of these breweries are engaging in and clearly why, you know, this will be our fourth brewery when we get it open next year. I love it. I love it. Second sizzle reel. My question to Robbie, the conversation with Robbie and uh, Duke and I all the way through that point, Harris, I'm going to throw it to you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Do you get? Do you think at all, um, as kind of a long-term planner and forecaster, mm -hmm. that we could reach a saturation point in the industry or category, or do you think it's kind of like restaurants, where like the more restaurants that come to the market kind of makes everybody be even better, which is good for the marketplace and the consumer. I think from an economic development perspective, um, definitely sort of like the restaurant industry where the more, for us, the more that the city has in, in city limits, the better, right? Obviously we're gonna benefit from the tax and meals tax if they're selling food and things like that. Um, for the businesses though, I mean, there definitely could be saturation, I believe, and it, you know, it's kind of that survival of the, the fittest mentality that um, you have to be marketing your brand and creating an experience that's gonna bring people back to you over and over again so that you're not getting lost in, in the mix of all the others. Totally agree with that. Yeah. Andre Xavier says, now it's gonna be viable for us to bring back our Charlottesville route again with another <laughs> brewery opening in the city. I think he's right. Mm -hmm. um, Duke, let me get you in the mix as far as Star Hill and um, historical perspective. We touched on this a little bit. West Main, um, as much a music hall as it was about the beer. Yes. Now the beer is like, Props to you. I mean, the beer is on freaking point. Um, now, the brand, where does the brand go from here? How does the brand continue to grow and get share, not just locally, maybe Commonwealth-wide, maybe outside the Commonwealth? Yeah, so obviously, as Robbie mentioned earlier, the brand's super well-known, of course. Um, so, you know, for us, we always have this music vibe. We do a lot of music sponsorships, as you know. Of course, that comes originally from the music hall, but also comes in terms of other marketing opportunities that we take. So that'll always be part of our DNA. You're going to see that in the New Dairy Project in terms terms of the art that's on the walls, the aesthetics, and the programming that's going to go on down there. We did the exact same thing down in Roanoke when we opened about a year and a half ago. Business has been very successful and has exponentially grown our brand in that grocery channel, as we, as I mentioned earlier, outside of just the four walls of the Roanoke Brewery itself. Mm -hmm. Richmond, we're going in, Scott's Edition, uh, that'll open sometime this fall, that'll be another one, and then of course Charlottesville, and the idea is the same, which is People know our brand because we're older, we've been around, we're from Virginia, et cetera, but I also immediately connect to the music side mm -hmm. of the business. And that's because one, the names of our brands, the art that we have on our bottles and cans, but also because of the aesthetics mm -hmm. and the vibe that we're gonna have in the four walls of all these tap rooms. Folks watching in Roanoke, Richmond, DC, and in North Carolina right now, give it a like and give it a share on any of the seven channels you're watching. Robbie, the beer, um, right up in your uh, wheelhouse here. Um, talk to us about how you have uh, evolved the beer improve the beer since you've arrived at Star Hill? Yeah, so it's been, uh, you know, the, I think the most, um, the most stark change in craft beer in general over the past 10 years has been um, the focus on quality. So really when I've, I went to brewing school in Germany and, um, and moved basically out of school straight into the, the job at Star Hill, and that was the number one topic that everyone was talking about. We'd gotten to the point where everyone had gotten relatively large, but then the focal point around every industry-related thing was quality, quality, quality. And I think that that's really driven the focus on, from brewers from uh, to pay attention to the raw materials, to pay attention to the science, to hire well, um, to train well, to do all of the things. Uh, and maybe it ends up costing a little more money, but they're higher paying jobs and you're gonna hold people around. Um, you know, I think that the, that focus on quality has helped drive all of beer up. Um, specifically at Star Hill, it was the same thing. We were a packaging brewery distributing all over the state of Virginia, but also at the time, you know, outside of Virginia, and you have to protect uh, your brand quality because if you don't, then it's the kiss of death, right? If someone goes and they have an experience with your brand and they're like, oh, this is not, this is not something I'm looking for, they're never going to pick it up again generally. And you really only get one shot with the number of brews that are out there right now. So um, we've hired extremely well. Um, I think that that's kind of uh, been our key to success is going out and recruiting um, aggressively. Uh, and we probably pay a little bit higher than the market, um, but it pays so it pays dividends uh, beyond what we kind of would have ever expected because uh, you've got folks who are committed to the brand, um, who are doing you know the best job, but they're also better educated. They, we've got a bunch of kids who came from brewing school um, who've been traditionally trained in brewing, um, and so they understand what the goals are of the brand and how to make sure that we are putting our best foot forward in every sampling opportunity that we get. Love that answer. Third sizzle reel right there. My question to Duke and then the answer from Robbie. He had some key words that Oh yeah, my ears perked up. I was up. Gonna I say, heard, yes. like, salary. <laughs> I got really excited. Hiring, oh yeah. Workforce, <laughs> jump in here. I mean, workforce development. Um, when 
we, we have a, a, a program at Piedmont. I mm -hmm. think Danny Wolf is teaching that, mm -hmm. um, where he's trying to train folks to get into the category. Mm -hmm. How does City Hall rally around this? How does your position, your yeah. department rally around this? So I think, you know, in terms of workforce development, the services that we have to offer employers, so we can, we almost serve as like a temp agency where we can help recruit for you and identify people who are coming to see us through the downtown job center. You know, I was also thinking as, as you were talking, Robbie, about opportunities for our local residents and, and what partnerships we might be able to create in order to make sure that disadvantaged populations in our areas can benefit from the industry. Um, you mentioned you know you have people who are highly educated well trained but but what could we potentially do in order to you know take some of our people who are living in public housing and teach them these skills so that they can make a self-sufficient wage and be self-sustaining as well I love it and this sizzle reel with that answer there that was a great answer mm -hmm. um, we got somebody we got Keith chiming in James it's exactly one mile from Champion Brewery to the new Star Hill at Dairy Central I see a craft beer crawl in our future bro my <laughs> count it will be a, a minimum of six stops are you in James that I want to be on that beer crawl as well. Uh, what can we expect, Duke, from Dairy Central in totality? I know this is the first tenant to be announced, but I know you kind of have a big picture of what's happening here. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look at other major successful food halls, you know, Union Market in D.C., mm -hmm. if you're familiar with that um, concept over by Gallaudet University, mm -hmm. obviously Chelsea Market in New York, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's the idea, right, is to have high-end artisan type food products that are there, which are going to bring in great jobs, mm -hmm. of course, but we're going to be the you know area where you can bring the tacos mm -hmm. or you can bring the Thai food or the soul food or whatever you have over to our area to eat, and hopefully you get an experience. Maybe you grab a beer. Maybe you're just meeting a friend for lunch. That's the concept is it's going to be kind of a holistic area where people can um, you know, try different foods, try different beers, and obviously hopefully a place where people go to meet and um, socialize. You said Dairy Central because of the proximity to town, the brand awareness potential. I mean, a ton of freaking cars drive by Dairy Central all the time. Um, how about the commitment perhaps to like the neighborhood? Yeah. Um, throw that to you. Yeah, so, you know, one is obviously they're bringing jobs to the neighborhood, of course. Um, second thing is they're going to build on a huge parking area, so that's going to bring people more into mm -hmm. that part of town. As you guys know, on Preston, parking's pretty difficult right. overall. So some of the success our friends at Cardinal Hall and some of the other places have had is because they have built-in mm -hmm. parking that's there. That's a big um, deterrent for people, especially like me, to have young kids <laughs> to be able to go to a place that doesn't have parking. That doesn't really work. So as I mentioned earlier, when we were looking for different places in town, that was a huge uh, necessary uh, um, amenity that we were going to require for any place for us to go, and that's one of the reasons we did that. Uh, Same. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, and then in terms of you know the the food hall vendors themselves, you know you're probably going to get announcements relatively soon as it relates to new food hall vendors that are going to be coming in there as they fill up that space over the next uh, you know six months or so. I can't wait for it. Same question yeah. for you here. I mean, this is coming. Um, an, an ecosystem mm -hmm. is coming to um, an important neighborhood that needs job opportunities. Exactly. Throw that to you. Well, first of all, I'm super excited about the synergy that can be created between Star Hill and the smaller food vendors. Mm -hmm. um, just the impact Sorry. that you all will have on their uh, business just by being in that space as an anchor, you know. Um, but, you know, being in the neighborhood that you're going to be in, you're surrounded by individuals who come from disadvantaged populations and being able, again, to incorporate them into your into your business so that they also can benefit from from, from what you all are, are doing, just like the food food hall vendors will be able to do. I'm super pumped about this. How are you going to split your time um, between the locations? Between all four of them at that <laughs> point? Yeah. How's that going to work? Yeah, are you so, going to clone yourself? Well, so one of the things that we that kind of piggies back on on the uh, what we've been doing over the past eight years as it relates to beer quality has been cross training our brewers. So awesome. we've been very focused in in brewer brewer development. Traditionally, the industry has had this segmented group um, where there's only you know you have a very specific job in the brewery. Uh, we kind of threw that out the window and we're like you're going to learn how to do everything, mm -hmm. including running all of our pilot breweries. So I may not have cloned myself but i've got guys who i trust you train well um, and have trained well that will, they'll be able to handle and pick it up and it's interesting it's good for them i mean for the most part i handle all of the brand development as on the corporate level you know the the big the riskier things for example i don't want them to have to feel um 
responsible for the success of a brand uh, based on their recipe. But what it allows them to do is still express creative desires that they have as employees um, in a smaller scale environment and be able to come out and connect with people that way. So, hey, you know, bring your friends out to the, the, the pub because the beer that you brewed is on this week. Uh, we want to be able to offer our employees those things as well and also, you know, obviously spread their creative juices to um, the overall Star Hill public, I guess you could say. So. I love it. Welcome Pro Renata to the show. Pro Renata's watching. Mm -hmm. Welcome Ardent in Richmond to the show. Thank you for tuning in. Let me throw this to you. Um, are we going to expect different types of beer at each location like unique to that location yep so right now right now we have one we have two operating tap rooms um in roanoke and in crozet um and shortly you know by the end of the year we are looking at having the third in richmond and then early in 2020 we'll have fourth and so we have to create a differentiating experience between each one of these breweries so it's not just the same 24 beers on tap and you just go to the different locations um, so we are going to have uh, some very specific um, brewing that goes on in charlottesville that will only be available in charlottesville that's awesome um, it's exclusive to that brew pub and like you're mentioning kind of the uh the brew trailer or whatever, I mean, internally, you could create almost a brewery type experience mm -hmm. in between each one of our tap rooms. Mm -hmm. So if, for the Star Hill super fans out there, you know, we'll give you a little uh, a badge for going to every tap room and trying those unique specific mm -hmm. beers from those tap rooms. But yeah, the idea is that we want to create something that's not just unique um, or differentiated from the rest of the industry, but also from internally, we don't want to just regurgitate the same thing over and over again. I'm going to throw a follow up to Robbie. I'm going to prep you with this question. Mm -hmm. uh, with economic development and City Hall, do you guys consider moving forward with even a greater marketing push for branding beer in the city of Charlottesville mm -hmm. to make it even more of a destination mm -hmm. type of situation, maybe in strategic markets like Charlotte, like Northern Virginia, maybe in strategic market markets like Asheville, mm -hmm. like the Tennessee area that are close to driving range. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome Vale Brewing Company from Scott's Edition to the show. Um, the question I have for you is if a beer that's specific to say Dairy Central or specific to say Roanoke or Scott's Edition is performing at a very high clip, is that a beta test that you then put into mainstream? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's what there's for, it's exactly what you're talking about is, it's the less risky um, environment where it allows you to then take more risks. On the production side, um, you know, we were really focused on making our core brands for the most part, you know, most every day is a Northern Lights Day, for example. Um, is that it, your number one? Number, yes, yeah. number one, by a Long shot. large clip, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like Dave uh, Warwick has said on this show, 40 mile, yeah. is the beer that made three notch. Right. Yeah. Mm. Northern Lights is the beer that made Star Hill. Mm -hmm. So we've been, um, you know, most of our efforts are spent towards making the Northern Lights of the world, but, you know, a lot of our ideas come from these small pilot batches um, that we can test the waters with and see consumer reaction um, and then build from there. And that's what makes it um, kind of an engaging R&D process. Mm -hmm. I love it, I love it, I love it. Um, throwing it to you. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about this with um, the interim executive director of the CACVB, Adam Healy, right. about the need to make a stronger marketing push. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna throw it open-ended so you can sure. go anywhere you want. Sure. Um, I see as a businessman and as a conscious capitalist an opportunity to continue to raise the profile of Charlottesville as this freaking amazing destination for not just beer and mm -hmm. wine, but the outdoors, ACC sports, mm -hmm. just great quality of life. How do we continue to drive the marketing push for Charlottesville, maybe as it pertains to beer um, from a micro standpoint and also as it pertains to Charlottesville from a macro standpoint? So when you prepped me earlier on to give me a little heads up, um, I was automatically thinking about the CACVB and the uh, marketing campaigns that they currently have and could have in, potentially in the future um, focused on the craft brewery industry and other major industries in in the area i mean from a regional perspective that would be the entity i think that would drive that that train um, in terms of economic development in the city we would be here to support um, city city businesses any businesses located in the city and help you know create awareness and, and drive traffic to you love that answer i'm going to get duke in the mix here how do you see this is the toughest question for you how do you see what is the role of the municipalities of local government mm -hmm. Um, of say like a city hall or an Almoral County to like marketing and branding and creating this like ecosystem if you may. Yeah, so 
uh, go back again to the Asheville example mm -hmm. that we've used multiple times. When you go to Asheville and you stay at a hotel uh, right in town, the first thing they give you when you go in there is a beer trail mm -hmm. menu, uh, a map, excuse me, of everything that's available, mm -hmm. both in the city itself as also around uh, town. So, you know, that's an idea mm -hmm. that we could easily do. Um, obviously, Charlottesville's got a lot of things that are driving traffic mm -hmm. here, starting at the University of Monticello, mm -hmm. et cetera. But we see it all the time from uh, the wineries, the folks that are out there visiting wineries in the, uh, on their vacations, and of course the breweries. You mentioned the Hop on Tour guys earlier. They bring you know, buses of people to all of the breweries that you mentioned almost every weekend. And it's becoming a situation where people from Northern Virginia or other parts of the state are coming to Charlottesville as an area where they can hit three, four, five you know, breweries, stay overnight, creates mm -hmm. obviously taxes for the city as well, and uh, you know, business for, for folks outside of just the wineries and the breweries. Strange Ways Brewery, welcome to the show. We got Mount Ida watching as well right now. Give it a like, give it a share. Ray Cadell, thank you for watching. Thomas Link is senior, thank you for watching. You're getting some props from, is this family? Lois Lee? That, yeah, that's my mom. <laughs> my <laughs> mom. You just found this, you're doing great. <laughs> um, if you'd like to relay anything to the uh, round table, I'm happy to do this. This has come in, and this is probably a question for you, Duke. Um, Dairy Central will have affordable housing units within it as well. Stony that's Point Design um, and Chris Henry and his team get new and good construction throw that to you anywhere you want to go yeah i don't know all the details with the housing portion but obviously phase one is the front portion which is the food hall and then phase two is the housing that goes behind and i believe some office space as well that's going in there clearly housing obviously is a major problem in charlottesville especially affordable housing so obviously that's something that they're invested in in terms of getting the project uh, through. I love it. I love it. This question for you. It seems like everywhere you go, and I fall into this category as well, craft beer is synonymous with IPAs. Mm -hmm. um, IPAs are almost like, first, educate me. What percentage of the category of consumption is IPAs in the craft category? It's about a third. Yeah. Is it a third? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then how is the remaining two thirds splintered? amongst various different kinds of brands. I mean, it's it kind of peters, I think, wheat beers up there um, just because of some of the larger players in the wheat beer category, but it splinters down from there. I mean, IPA has been this powerhouse in craft beer for a long time. I mean, there's tons of different kinds of IPAs. The category is basically limitless, but also it was a very, very stark contrast to what beer availability was preceding the craft beer movement. Um, and so when people latched on to that, that kind of flavor profile, um, I think that it's, it's kind of now turned into what can we do with this style? I mean, we've gone through the fruited flavored ones. We've gone through, you know, we've got all these kinds of new hops and stuff that are being grown in the United States up in the Pacific Northwest. And people kind of latched on to IPAs. They like the general flavor profile and they want to try them all. It's great for us. Do we see the, the craft beer industry potentially um, having a new, like, popular, I mean, I, how, how much longer is IPA gonna last? I mean, people by nature are super fickle. It seems like the IPA has been around for, I'm a, I love the IPA, man. Oh I'm, yeah, just to jump in. So yeah. We look at, we, we um, purchase syndicated data, data uh -huh. so we can see what's going on in the grocery Trends. stores, just like many folks do yeah. as well. And as Robbie mentioned, about a third of the business is IPA. It's actually understated a little bit because the third biggest category is seasonal, and seasonal is about half of those are IPAs as well. So it's probably closer to 40% when it's all said and done. But what we look at is the market share shifts that are going on within the category. IPA is still taking market share within the overall craft category. On a so huge base. On an enormous base. So it's happening more and more, and it's become not that bitter you know, IPA that everybody remembers drinking uh, you know, 10 years ago. Sure. There's lots of different flavorings, so there's yep. a lot of room for, the spa for that sector to continue to expand. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I mean, Love I think that. I think that that's we're coming up. We're coming up with uh, actually really cool and interesting ways to continue this IPA role. Uh, you know, I've had the the most recent rise has kind of been the hazy IPA, the New England style IPA. Um, I think that the next forefront, uh, to be perfectly honest, with IPAs isn't going to be in hops. It's going to be in yeast. So mm -hmm. we'll be very interested to kind of see how that goes. Um, but yeah, I think that there's tons of different uh, opportunities within that single category to continue for it to continue to grow. Right. And again, its base is so large to see its performance continue like this. It, you, it's very difficult to bet against that. Um, I, I love this conversation. We have a, a question that I think is very apropos here. It's coming from one of your colleagues. I met him at the award, Better Business Awards mm -hmm. Banquet, Kyle Urban. Ah, yes. Hey, he's Kyle. watching right now. <laughs> I believe right. he's the marketing manager at Charlottesville Transit. That's correct. Okay. He has this topic, and we've touched on this briefly with Seville Hop on Tours. He says, Holly and the Star Hill fellas 
how do transit and beer relate to each other? He's speaking specifically from Charlottesville transit. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's Air, there's uh, there's Uber, Seville mm -hmm. Hop On mm -hmm. Tours. There's one of our clients, is Cameron Limousine. It's part of this show here. I'm going to throw that topic to you. I think it has a, a huge impact on the transportation transit industry. I mean, in terms of people going around from from place to place on these ale trails, and if, depending on how far apart they are, I mean, mm -hmm. definitely want to have you know, designated transportation for, for people who are enjoying themselves so they don't have to worry about driving and that sort of thing. Uh, public transportation, uh, CAT, Charlottesville Area Transit in particular, people can, you know, hop on a bus and go from place to place in, in town um, and, and get around and have a good time. I love it. You're getting some props from uh, a gentleman who's watching in Ohio. Um, he says, I don't know if I know him. <laughs> uh, I'm watching from Ohio. Okay. I got a job due to the, uh, the job center that Holly's oh, a part wow. of in Charlottesville. Um, I then took that job and parlayed it to where I'm at in Ohio right now. Thank you, Holly, and your entire team for all you have done. You're welcome. That's um, great to hear. NB, you may know this, NB. Oh, yes. Yes, you know NAR. NAR. Okay. <laughs> and, and NAR actually, he went through our Go Driver training program and drove a bus. He got a CDL, so he's actually in transit, public transportation in Ohio as well. Awesome. I love it. Hey, I NAR. It. Um, <laughs> hey, NAR. <laughs> Thank you for watching the show. Um, throw this to you, Robbie. I'm just, I'm a, I love beer. I drink beer often, <laughs> probably more so than I should. Um, the, the question I have for you is, do you see potentially um, another uh, beer gaining share in the category? I mean, you guys have said to us that the IPA is gaining more and more and more share. Yeah. I love stouts, mm -hmm. big fan of the duck rabbit, yep. milk stout. Um, I'll get out of your way on that one. So I think that the most recent kind of entrant into category that really five years ago, no one was talking about is kind of the sour category. Yes. So we've seen, um, we've able, we've been able to release a few. Um, it's folks who maybe don't enjoy the particular taste of you know, historical beer, um, whether it's you know, their personal preference and they'll come in and they'll have these sours and they're like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that this was even possible. And that's kind of what fits their, their personal palette. I think that that's been the most surprising entrant. And I think that the other thing that we're going to see um, is, you know, we've seen it for a while now, but this session category, which is this easy drinking category um, that has been around. We've done it with Grateful for, for example, like the pale ale category. Um, well, just the grateful. regular uh, kind of even keeled alcohol, not, you know, not really the double digit alcohol range. We're kind of keeping it at the 5% range. So you can have a handful. Um, I think that's going to be the other interesting segment to kind of pay attention to. I love it. Final question. And I'm going to throw the same one to both you guys. Mm -hmm. um, Duke, what can we expect from Star Hill? Say in the next, um, I'm a huge benchmark and goal guy, the next three, five and 10 years for Star Hill. Yeah, so we've taken um, our capital and reinvested really in the Commonwealth in Virginia. That's where our focus is as a brand. Um, it's become very difficult to build these brands outside of your home state and even out of your home market. It's gotten so, um, you know, so centralized. So what we're doing is continue to invest in our state, in our market. So obviously the announcement in Richmond from earlier this year and then yesterday's announcement on the dairy are two examples of that. Um, we are looking at other opportunities in the state as well to continue to invest. And again, it gives you that branding experience that allows us to grow our brand outside of uh, you know the four walls of, of the tap room itself so that's really what our focus is on right now uh, how the market changes over the next five to ten years not sure but you know when Robbie and I started the market was growing you know 15 to 20 percent mm -hmm. you know it's probably growing you know two to four percent now so it's still a decent growth rate but obviously a fraction of what we saw and as a result of that you know everybody has had to change their business model to some degree for the current environment that we're in yep. that's what we're doing we believe in the home state we believe in focusing on Virginia and that's where we're going to continue to invest our money. I love that answer. I got just the curiosity in me. <laughs> love the business mm -hmm. line. One more follow up for you. Sure. Is the plan potentially a, a an exit to a, a major player? Mm -hmm. I, that's not even the cards right I, now. I, I don't think so. I mean, there's been some major exits, obviously, locally as Devil's well as backbone, yeah. yeah, and Ballast Point and, 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 and Lagunitas on a national level. And that's happened. But as the market slowed down, I think there's less appetite from those larger breweries to be investing so much capital. And if they are investing the capital, it's sure going to be at a lot lower valuation 
than the transactions that happened over the last two to five years. We know that for a fact. So um, I think that's probably not a good business model right now to be focused on and try to figure out how to make money in your business model, how to continue to add employees, how to continue to grow your business is really the approach. And if that happens, that happens. I respect that answer right there. Um, same question for you. What can we expect from uh, workforce development and your department for the next three years or so? So for us, it's definitely going to be to continue to foster an environment where businesses can start up, grow and thrive. Um, so for instance, like Star Hill, um, you know, coming back to the city after, after some time, we're happy to have you back. Um, making sure that there are opportunities for everyone in our community to, who, if they want to start a business, if they want to get skills and training to get a new job that pays a self-sufficient wage. Um, just creating those opportunities for people um, who really want them. Love it. Yeah. You rocked. Thank you. Thank and you. we're on time. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. I <laughs> yeah. get to my meeting. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Yep. Thanks we for appreciate having you guys. You. Um, we close the show the same way every single time. We ask everybody that's watching to embody the golden rule. We don't make it about religion. We do make it about treating other people with the same respect that you want to be treated with yourself. It's the golden rule. Um, I'm Jerry Miller. It's the I Love Seville Show. Tomorrow is live music. Every Friday we host live music on the I Love Seville Show. A lot of bands that play Fridays after five, the Southern, the Jefferson, they come here. They get a taste of what they have to offer, and then we encourage you to go support them at the show that they're playing this particular weekend. Um, enjoy your afternoon. We'll see you at 3 o'clock with our charity-based show, and today we're going to spotlight Caring for Creatures, Thursdays at 3 on the I Love Seville Network. Take care. Good work. Wow. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much for having yeah, us. Our pleasure. Yeah. Uh, 110 on the dock. Okay. So and I heard so much about beer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's pressure. This was great. Uh, Holly, I'll read.